comenzaremos la preparación de un mojito. Le colocaremos sugar, and lime, mint, maceramos, luego le colocaremos drum, and ice. Club soda. And sugar cane. Y para culminar, mint. Bonita, mojito, salud. I'm Chris Rupp, Executive Director of Dade Heritage Trust, and in our continuing efforts to bring conference participants a flavor of Miami, I want to introduce you to Bill Fuller, the owner of the world-famous Ball and Chain in Little Havana. Bill, can you tell our participants about your investment in Little Havana? Chris, great to welcome you here to the Ball and Chain. Little Havana, uh, for me, was a passion project, uh, mainly because my mother is of Cuban heritage. And uh, it was a way of merging both uh, my interest in real estate uh, with my passion of the heritage. And really, at the same time, falling in love with the historic building stock, the authenticity of the neighborhood that existed, its people, which I even till today believe it's, a, it's one of its greatest resources and riches. Um, and it was the idea of, of working on these fine buildings and working with the people and creatives, entrepreneurs, restaurateurs in reassembling and developing a renaissance around this wonderful street, which we have as Calle Ocho. Um, and uh, I think it's going pretty well so far. Bill, Little Havana is the second most visited place in Miami after South Beach. What has been the effect of your investment and vision for the neighborhood? Yeah, it wasn't always like that. Uh, when we first started investing in Little Havana in 2004, based on what we know from the Greater Miami Convention Visitors Bureau, um, the visitors to the street were about 250,000 a year. So now we uh, realize about 4 million a year, which represents about a quarter of the visitors that come to Miami-Dade. So it's been an exponential growth, um, and it's but, it, but it's been a responsible growth. It's been one where it hasn't required any new, large, disruptive buildings to take place in the neighborhood. Uh, it's, we've been very sensitive to the original building stock. We've been very considerate of heritage businesses that have existed and families that have run those businesses for years. Um, and we really tried to keep as much of the national tenancy out of what we call the cultural historic district. Um, they're great, but uh, you know when people come here, they're looking for something really unique and authentic. As a developer, why do you invest in historic properties and see preservation as a positive? For us, it's really uh, in the hard drive and DNA of our company. Uh, my partner, Martin Penny and I, um, we are aligned on so many levels, but that being a really important bedrock of the company that we really respect the history of Miami, of South Florida, of everything that has happened in our past. It's so important to keep retelling, keep, important to keep sharing with future generations to come. All of these properties, um, the historic properties and even the legacy businesses um, are, are so important to keep around and to protect and cherish. And it's, it's just part of the message. It's part of what drives us. It's part of what drives our passion. Um, exploring and understanding the history is a, a fun part of the expedition, but then also bringing it back to life where new, new generations can 
remember, uh, you know, what it was like to be. And, and as South Florida, we're in a really unique space right now because of the development, the high rise and mid rise um, entrenchment that we have coming into our community. And we're going to be under constant pressure for decades to come. Um, the reality is, is that we have very scarce uh, land in, in South Florida and our historic building stock is going to be under pressure forever. Um, and so we really need to look back at our earliest building stock, which are these like we're sitting in today, 1920s, 30s, and uh, in some cases, even 1910 that we have here in the neighborhood and really look to protect as many of those structures as we can, because they do age uh, almost like a fine wine. As I look back on the history of our renaissance, let's say over the last 15 years, there's very specific businesses that I can point to that I think were real game changers. One of the first um, was a Sucat ice cream, uh, Susie Battle, developing a Cuban-based ice cream, all original, one of a kind. Um, and then came the ball and chain. Uh, and ball and chain was absolutely a catalyst. It showed fellow uh, food and beverage operators in South Florida that we could drive very high volume numbers out of an establishment like this. And really, Cayocho in Little Havana was always overlooked. It was, it, was over, it was overlooked as a neighborhood that was an immigrant neighborhood, a neighborhood that really was not at the top of the hospitality game. And all of that has radically changed over the last few years. Many of uh, my fellow food and beverage uh, operators, top of class, are now in the neighborhood. They have great concepts continues to drive the entertainment and the traffic to the neighborhood. Um, and I think it's gonna to continue to grow uh, in the near future. What will drive the continued success of Little Havana? The success of Little Havana is predicated on preserving the people that live here. Um, it's really, really important. It's, they're not just talking words. It's really important that we find a way to embrace all of the different economic classes that have been part of the foundation of this neighborhood. It is what is the authentic part of Little Havana. It is what drives me and keeps us all grounded that we are part of a real community, not a fabrication. Um, and it's important that we protect the people because without the people, everything that we have protected then becomes in a sense superficial. Um, so th that is really the heartbeat when we discuss El, uh, El Corazon de Miami. Uh, we're talking about the epicenter. Little Havana is the geographic epicenter of all of our great neighborhoods, the Grove, the Gables, the Beach, North Miami. Um, but it's really the corazón, the heartbeat is the people. It's that energy that's driven. It's that working force that really drives uh, all the creative and ambition that we, that we see in the neighborhood. Bill, tell us about the history of the ball and chain. Right here where we are today, the Ball and Chain, uh, originally opened in 1935, had uh, 22 years of great history, really important on the music scene in South Florida, hosted some of the best acts in the country at the time, Count Basie, Billie Holiday, Chet Baker, Lena Horne. Um, closed actually in 1957, uh, Count Basie sued the owner, um, Henry Sheckman, which was an important individual at the time, uh, maybe a little bit uh, notorious. He was part of Meyer Lansky's group, but yet he, he also was the owner of the Tower Hotel, which is becoming another great um, uh, revitalization project that we're working on. Um, and, you know, in 2013, we brought it back as best as we could with the storytelling as if it had never closed. If it had never closed, we would have continued to have live music. We would have continued to do it without uh, any covers, which is the way we do it today. 90 hours of music produced live every week. Um, and it's become really the musical heartbeat of the neighborhood. Bill, you served as a board member for Dade Heritage Trust. What does the organization mean to you? I just think that uh, as being a proud member of Data Heritage Trust for several years and watching the growth of the organization and knowing now that it's in its 50th year, uh, it's really an incredible institution that in South Florida and Miami, uh, Dade, uh, we're very grateful to have the organization, all the great leadership behind it, the great members, everybody is deeply passionate about it. And the message is really, uh, it has taken root and has a great foundation to move forward into the future generations. Thank you. Thank you.